My name is Brad Chilcott and I'm coming to you from what is and always will be the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. I pay my respects to Elders past, present and future of these lands and also to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people joining us from many different lands uh, across what is now called Australia. It's really essential that we remember the privilege many of us enjoy came at great cost to others, that sovereignty was never ceded and that injustice continues to this day. And that First Peoples are disproportionately impacted by many of the issues we'll talk about tonight as a result of ongoing colonisation, paternalism and racism. And we um, at White Ribbon Australia and the Harmony Alliance uh, and our panellists collectively commit to walking with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in a spirit of harmony towards a future where everyone has equal opportunity to belong, contribute and thrive in this society. As you know, I'm here with two incredible women, Nidal Nguyen and Jess Hill, who I'll introduce more fully in just a couple of minutes, but you can wave, both of you, if you're there. Um, and I like using gallery mode when we're on these big Zoom events because I can see everyone's excellent, beautiful faces who's, who've joined us. So you can click gallery mode in the top right of your screen if you, if you like to work your way through and see all the guests. Um, before I introduce our panelists, a couple of administrative things. We had hope over a hundred, uh, over a hundred, over 700 people registered tonight and the chat function is on. Um, you'll see if you ask some questions that Scott and Trent from White Ribbon Australia are there in the chat and they can answer some of your questions. Uh, but also AFSA and Patrick from Essential are here to moderate um, if needed, and they can respond to any of your tech questions. So if it's not working for you or the audio drops out or anything else goes wrong, reach out and AFSA and Patrick will hook you up. Um, but I do want to say that we will exclude anyone very quickly who isn't helping us create a safe space and we won't tolerate any misogyny, racism, homophobia or transphobia in this conversation or indeed anything that makes people feel unsafe. So please respect that, otherwise we'll need to remove your ability to contribute to the chat. We're also live streaming to Facebook. So hello everyone on Facebook and please respect those guidelines on the chat there as well. Sasha from White Ribbon is, uh, and Communique is looking after that for us. Um, so thank you again for joining us and I'd like to let you know a little more about our two guests before we get into this conversation. So Nairo Nguyen is the chair of the Harmony Alliance, which is uh, an organisation that exists to champion and, and uh, walk with migrant and refugee women for change. She's a lawyer, community advocate, writer and an accomplished public speaker. Nairo was born in a refugee camp in Itang, Ethiopia, and raised in Kakuma refugee camp in Kenya. In 2005, at the age of 18, she moved to Australia as a refugee, and since then has completed a Bachelor of Arts from Victoria University and a Juris Doctor from the University of Melbourne, and now works as a commercial litigator with Arnold Block Liebler. She's a vocal advocate for human rights, migrant and refugee women, and the settlement of people with refugee experiences and those seeking asylum. She's worked and volunteered extensively in these areas with a range of organisations, and you might see her regularly on the drum, on Q&A, and she contributes to The Age and The Saturday Paper and many other publications. In 2011 and 2014, Nayadol was nominated as one of the 100 most influential African Australians. In 2016, she was the recipient of the Future Justice Prize. In 2018, her efforts to combat racism were widely recognised with achievements, including the Australian Human Rights Commission's Racism It Stops With Me Award, for her advocacy and activism on behalf of the Australian, African and Melbourne's South Sudanese communities and the Harmony Alliance Award for significant contribution to empowering refugee and migrant women. Nida was a co-winner of the Tim McCoy Prize for her advocacy on behalf of the South Sudanese community 
and received the Afro-Australian Student Organisation Unsung Hero Award. So Nairo, how are you tonight? Can you say hello? Um, very well, thanks. And um, if you've been following the news and if you are in Melbourne, um, our numbers are getting down. So that's an extra thing to be tremendously excited about. Fantastic. It's great to have you with us. And I did want to say that on behalf of White Ribbon Australia, Harmony Alliance and our audience and actually all decent Australians, where we are sorry for the way you've been treated and the organised attacks by right wing extremists over the last few weeks and want to say to you that there are many, many thousands who stand with you in support and solidarity and thousands of us are working hard to build a future where fear and division are no longer rewarded at election time and where prejudice has no place in politics or society. So um, we're with you, Nidal, and, and we are sorry for what you've experienced over the last couple of weeks. Um, um very much and thanks for support everyone. And I'd like to introduce Jess Hill. She's a Walkley a winning Walkley Award winning investigative journalist and author who's been reporting exclusively on domestic abu abuse since 2014. Prior to this, she was a Middle East correspondent and producer rep reporter across ABC TV and radio. In 2019, she published her first book, See What You Made Me Do which is about the phenom phenom I never can say phenomenon. <laughs> put that in your bio, phenomenon <laughs> of domestic abuse in Australia. Uh, it was awarded the 2020 Stella Prize and has been shortlisted for a lot of other prizes, include, including the Walkley Book Award. In 2020, she's adapting her book into a three-part series for SBS, which I'm really looking forward to, and is producing a podcast series with the Victorian Women's Trust. So welcome, Jess. How thanks. are you? Yeah, thanks, Brad. I'm pretty good. Yeah. It's fantastic to have you with us. And I'm lucky enough to be in Sydney with, with Jess um, here in the office in uh, George Street. So it's wonderful to see you in person. <laughs> and I reckon Melbourne will be soon, Melbourneites will soon be able to say things like that too. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Um, as I mentioned earlier, just before we get into the conversation itself, this event is co-hosted by the Harmony Alliance and White Ribbon Australia, but it's um, part of National Unity Week, a joint initiative of Welcoming Australia and the Lebanese Muslim Association, which is designed to advance intercultural and interfaith connections, understanding and respect. The theme this year is Solidarity, Together We Rise. And I've been really thankful um, alongside this to the Harmony Alliance for their willingness to enter into a MOU with White Ribbon Australia so that we can listen to and learn from you on our journey. And so we can partner with you in advocating for the rights, safety and inclusion of refugee and migrant women. And so tonight we're speaking about what that solidarity looks like in the context of gendered violence. How can people of different cultures and faiths and backgrounds work together as good allies in eliminating men's violence against women. So firstly, I want to ask um, Jess and Nairo a general question about allyship. It's also a question that relates, I think, to men's role in eliminating violence against women. But what does it mean to be a good ally across cultures, faiths and background? We often hear this kind of language, especially during COVID, all in this together and, and solidarity. But what does that mean in practice? Like what are the, the building blocks of good allyship? Um, over to you first, Nairo. Uh, I think that's a, it's a good question, but it just, it's a tough question to answer because I think um, where people need allies tend to be areas that bring up really difficult conversations about power and, and power relations. And that necessarily puts some people in a level of discomfort, whether it's um, whether when you're talking about allies in, in terms of, uh, you know, gen, in, in this context of gender, that in itself involves a discussion of power and sometimes a letting go of power. And it's very hard to get people to the first point of recognizing that they might have power. And if it's in the context of um, you know, race or interse intersectional context in where it's, you know, gender and race, so it's migrant women or refugee women, 
Um, then there is the additional, you know, um, context uh, where uh, the racial issue might be something that you might need allies on to uh, help assist you advance that, and that in itself also raises, you know, questions of power relations. And what tends to happen in this group is that people, people who have good intentions of um, want to be ally in this fray, in this space can be afraid of getting it wrong mm -hmm. because if you get it wrong in this context you tend to hurt people that already feels hurt because the system has the disadvantages of disempowered them and the reaction sometimes can be quite confronting for people who have never had to deal uh, with the reaction of someone who feels as if the ally has missed the point i think one of the biggest mistakes though as an ally you can make is to um, prioritize your voice more than the voices of the people that you're trying to work along with. Um, and that sometimes doesn't have to be conscious. Uh, I can give you my own example. I came to this country as a refugee um, and I immediately got into the whole involvement in citizenship. You know, I became an Australian citizen. I became an ambassador for the Australia Day. I, completely engage in this context of constructing an identity as an Australian, which was not involved at all with the conversations about what happens to Indigenous Australians. Like this was, I was doing this at the same time where Indigenous people were talking about not having Australia Day. And I think, you know, there've been contexts as well where I've been, been invited in platforms where um, I'm asked to speak about race or racism as if I can speak to the experiences of indigenous people. And I think if one is not careful in that space, you form of an obstacle because um, people think that because they have a black woman on the platform that somehow they've addressed black experiences, but that's not true. I mean, my experiences of a black woman in this country are entirely different from the experiences of an indigenous woman and what they have to deal with and what their family and, and community has historically have to deal with. And so I think when, you know, when you want to be an ally, because you either have, and I think people who tend to want to be allies are people who have a, a leaning towards social justice and improving society. The first point really is, is to educate yourself mm -hmm. uh, uh, and to really investigate your own assumptions and preferences uh, and biases. To engage in that very uncomfortable uh, process of unlearning. And after you've tried, when you start to engage in these spaces, whether it's to participate in demonstration or conversation or pushback, um, to have a period in itself of learning and watching and, 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 and preparing yourself to be involved and to be prepared for the backlash when you, when you fail and to understand that um, just because you've, you've decided to be an ally doesn't mean, mean that your mistakes are not going to be pulled up when, when, they've, you know, when, when they've occurred and that they indeed should be pulled up because we're all in this process of of trying to learn and improve. And I think finally is, is the understanding that, um, that we can all, and I, when I say this, I, I've, I've somehow sometimes um, experienced some resistance, that we all have potential to be oppressors in some form or another. You know, we're not, it's the, the, the very concept that we, we all have agency to change something, man, so we, that agency in itself, when it fails, become oppressive. So I think we all should be aware that, you know, the best intention that we might have often fails. And what do we do when, 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 when that happens? I think we learn and we are, are humble enough to realize that we are in the course as allies to improve um, you know, whatever the cause is we, we're interested in, whether it's social justice, whether it's women's right. And it's not necessarily the disagreement we have with each other in this cause, mm -hmm. this space. It's about fighting for, for the bigger goal. And in my advocacy uh, experience, that's where I think I, I've, I've, I've seen a lot of trouble because negotiating those spaces between allies and, and, and the people that are experiencing the pain can become in themselves quite toxic and quite um, unproductive. And the very group of people that came to that platform to help each other and progress issues yeah. in fighting with each other and mm -hmm. be falling apart. And I think um, we, we're seeing that in some of the most progressive spaces. Um, and that's, 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 sad, that's sad to witness. In some ways, I think it's, it's a good thing, maybe. It's a thing that shows that there is learning happening <laughs> in some forms. Um, because we don't live in a perfect world. And so there's not going to be perfect forms of allyship and perfect forms of uh, solving solutions. The more difficult the issues are, whether it's on race or gender, the more 
I think significant the disagreements are going to be on. So, you know, as an ally, prepare for that and prepare for the long fight. Yeah, awesome. Um, Jess, I'm interested at, at the beginning, Nardo mentioned becoming aware of our, our own power as the place uh, to start at, as allies. Um, mm. How's that been a part of your experience of, of being an ally in this area of gendered violence and, and cross-culturally as well? Yeah, it's been a huge part. <clears throat> And when I was writing the book, you know, it's easy to say like, oh, smash the patriarchy and, you know, um, fuck men's violence and all the rest of it. Um, and it's, it's harder to look at where your own um, in a patriarch sits and where your own, um, you know, racism sits, where your own pre prejudice sits. Um, and I remember having some really uncomfortable moments with myself and just really having to reckon with my upbringing, you know, I was brought up on the northern beaches of Sydney and um, my, it's not a, um, there's not a lot of cross-cultural experience on the northern beaches and it was not until I was probably in my 20s that I realised that a lot of what I grew up with was pretty racist um, and that undoing that is the same process as I think all of us have to go through in undoing our patriarchal learning, you know, undoing the learnings of white supremacy, undoing all that. Um, and it's, as Nidal says, like, it's not something that you do perfectly every day. And it's something that what I, what I tried to do, and, and certainly when I was writing the book, was to um, foreground the strength of people who I was writing about, foreground their intelligence, foreground the expertise that they'd gain, not just through their experience, their trauma experience, but also through their life experience, um, but also work with them on their stories, not, you know, in terms of the power relationship as a writer, the power relationship that writers have with their subjects is that we write about people. You know, we, we interview them, they tell us our stories, then we write the story. And often, you know, especially people who've been abused in an intimate partner violence situation, their power has been taken away from them in a lot of cases, or, or certainly it's been deeply challenged. Their narrative has been taken away from them, their sense of who they are. So I really wanted to change that up and be like, well, this is your story. I'm just the messenger. Let's work together on telling it. So we would draft it together. You know, I'd write it, mm -hmm. then they'd check it, then we'd go back and forth and make sure that it was a story that reflected their experience. And in that was relationship building. And so when I'd be working with, you know, First Nations people or, um, or culturally and linguistically diverse people, um, that process was a process of allyship, of working out what was important to them, what was important for people to know about them. Um, so that's a big part for me of allyship. I, I mean, I don't have a lot to add to what Nidal's already said because it was so thorough what you said. Um, but what I would say is that allyship can be tricky on big issues that, that affect a lot of people like gendered violence, where you have, say for example, laws that will affect a vast number of people with, with different interests and, and different needs. And when you're an ally, when you want to be an ally, to marginalise people, those marginal groups, um, it's not like they're monoliths. There are massive disagreements within those groups. So I think it's not about being an unconditional ally that you just, you cannot agree with everybody. You can't, um, you can't be a unified front in terms of your, um, what sort of things you're advocating for, what sort of things you're pursuing. What I think you can do is think about how will these people be affected for the things I may be advocating. How, how would this language affect those people? But I think that sometimes, you know, we're gonna say things that are uncomfortable. Maybe they won't be right in the end. Maybe we'll have to rethink things based on the feedback that we get. But other times it might be that not everyone's going to agree, but you sort of, if you really have done the research and you think that no, this really is the best path forward, even if some people don't agree, you sort of just have to keep going. Um, so it's really, really tricky because I never want anybody to feel like I'm speaking over them or speaking for them. Um, and, and yet, you know, there are 2.3 million women who have survived intimate partner violence in this country. Mm. Yeah. Um, and they've, a number of them have got different ideas about how best to respond to that. And if I were to try to be an ally to every single one of those positions, 
I would just fall into a puddle. So, so I just have to listen to them and try to take into account their concerns, thinking about in particular the late, latest campaign around criminalising coercive control, trying to basic, I think allyship is basically listening to why mm. people may have concerns, why people might be for it, all of that, and making sure that in your advocacy, you are not leaving those concerns out, that you're not just pushing forward with an agenda that you have and letting those people sort of, yeah. you know, um, fall away in the meantime. I was going to add uh, something, if that's okay, and it's on the question. Oh. I think the reason why a lot of minority groups are exhausted with allies, I think it's because of the way it's been adapted in certain spaces by people whose intentions are not. I mean, you've, we've had people who are supposedly, you know, in, a, in, in interest of Indigenous people who have done tremendous harm to indigenous people so witnessing this and, it, and i think even donald trump is doing a very smart way of it where he employs someone who is anti-environment in the environmental you know, agency and so and, and it's similarly that way where we're seeing people who claim that they're allies claim that they're anti-racist and all that but clearly their history doesn't demonstrate that and so um, it, it is frustrating when you're in those, those spaces because that's 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 uh, that's when you really see the power of of the power structures operating because you know someone who happens to have held a public office before is heard more on indigenous issues than say an indigenous person living in those communities. Mm. That's when allyship become problematic. And that's another point, not all really important, um, is in certain spaces, not to step aside in the sense that like, you know, like for, for, you know, just speaking on my own behalf, you know, I've done five or six years research into domestic abuse now. And when I get opportunities to speak about it, I want to be able to speak about it, but I also see the opportunities where I can step aside and let's, and, and suggest someone else to take my place. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I've, 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 I've done that, you know, I mean, maybe this is a practice that others could adopt. And I think it's been adopted in other contexts where if I'm invited on a panel that I think that deserve to be an Indigenous person on it, I make sure that I make that known and I make sure that I ask them um, whether or not that position has been offered first to an Indigenous person. So that's stepping aside, truly stepping aside and saying, this is not a space for me, this is, and this, and, or certainly it can't be a space for only voices like mine alone. It must include mm -hmm. people. And then pushing either for them to set up a separate agenda that address that and indigenous views or um, making sure that there's another person present or in fact stepping down and, and not engaging. Yeah, the, the question of power and becoming aware of your own power is, is really interesting. And I think when, when someone decides that they would like to be an ally is kind of a moment where you have a teachable moment and start to think about your own your own power and and you start as as you've said um, along the way when you become try to be an ally and you get it wrong you quickly find out that you that you got it wrong um, but I, I'm interested in taking one one step back from that how, how do you get someone who I guess hasn't made that you know I've decided I care about racism or I've decided I care about gendered violence is there a way <clears throat> that you've seen that you can make someone start thinking about their own power or ref reflecting on that? Is there, a, is there a teachable moment before now I care about this social justice issue um, or, or something that makes somebody become suddenly aware of their power and how it can be problematic? Either of you jump in on that. What do you think? Two things. I think people, I think it's easy to hate what you don't know. So I think definitely um, telling powerful stories about group of people that divert mm. from uh, the danger of what has been called the danger of the single story. Um, that's important and, and, and I think that's why diversity in the media, in our politics and in our, our governance structures in this country needs to be far more reflective of the society because that's how we, we can tell these stories. We can either tell stories by telling them verbally, writing about them, or we can tell stories by the way people live their life in the public space. You know, so if you have a doctor who happens to be South Sudanese, publicly known and commenting, that, that's a story in itself. That doesn't need to be communicated and people can witness and see that there's a diversity of South Sudanese um, or people from South Sudanese background who are just not gangs, you know, waiting to sort of rob you at, at, at every opportunity. So that's one of it. Um, the other is, is, you know, the, 
I don't know how necessarily you generate this, but it's, it's, it's friendships, you know, getting to yeah. know people and building those relationships. And so in Canada, for example, where they, you know, introduced the, the, the community resettlement initi initiative where community members are able to sponsor refugees and, and support them, you know, a collection of friends or whatever come together, sponsor a refugee, uh, um, you know, and, and they bring them. That has really changed communities over there. It's been a very successful model because mm -hmm. people, get to know them these people get to live with them they get to become their friends and it's no longer an abstract notion you know it's personal yeah. at that level when you can when you know that kid or you know that friend or you know that uh you know um, sister who went through domestic abuse it's no longer it's no longer a, you know an abstract issue it becomes really personal and i think that's another way of getting uh, people to be interested um in this yeah. issue sometimes i think the last part is politics can be a really big motivator. I think what we're learning through what is happening now across the board, uh, the demonstration currently going on in Poland on the severe restrictions of abortion, you know, those people begin to realize that all these rights that we had and we thought were won and established that they can be taken away and that they can be in a very short period of time. And as we see the kind of civil movement across the United States on issues of race, on issues of democracy in Poland and in other countries, this is people now realizing that the, the rights and the privileges that allow them to live their day-to-day -day life um, are at risk. Mm. Yeah. yeah, I think, um, you know, and I can, I, I speak to, a, I guess, a, a different experience, you know, in the sense that what I was trying to do when I was writing the book was to um, to try to make men feel like this was a conversation they could be a part of, um, to try to help men understand the, the role they play in patriarchy and, um, and what patriarchy has given and taken away from them. And what was actually really helpful, because when I was writing the book and you, when you're researching like history of patriarchy, history of men's violence against women, I mean, it's very easy to go down and a total angry ant pathway where you're just kind of enraged from morning to night. And so I, I kind of got that out of my system um, after a few months and living with my therapist husband was useful because he sees a lot of these guys who kind of slip into abusive patterns, you know, in their relationships. They're not the hardcore perpetrators, but they're very harmful in their relationships. And what David was really able to sort of refocus my mind on is like, how do we speak to these guys? How do we get them to understand the power they hold? Because actually counterintuitively, a lot of these guys feel powerless, even though they act in a really entitled way and, and generally in their homes have established a situation in which they have more power than their partners. Um, so how do you get into that space where they're already feeling defensive, don't feel like they have any space to talk about this conversation, even the guys who are not being abusive can feel like just talking about domestic abuse, they're gonna get it wrong. Like Nidal said, you know, you, you're basically gonna get, put your foot wrong and then you're gonna get it cut off. Um, <laughs> And so what I really tried to do in the book was to match um, accountability with understanding and show through um, chapters on, you know, toxic male shame and also the chapter on patriarchy that this is, um, if you can grapple with your own power and grapple with what different kinds of privilege you have um, as a male, and that's a privilege is a really difficult um, concept to really unpack, but let's just say a, an entitlement to power, um, that actually undoing that patriarchal learning in yourself, which has taught you as men to really favour control, autonomy, which is you know, separation, um, to, to favour um, not trusting, to, to always seek um, higher status and power over, that actually learning how to let go of that is going to open up so many opportunities for better intimacy, better friendships, more peace. You know, that this patriarchal system, while we talk a lot about men using it to overpower women, it's also used by men to overpower other men and to create... Um, a pecking order that men are often acutely aware of. Um, I remember in a men's behavior change program, 
when the facilitator was talking about shame and asked the men in the group to say, what does shame look like? You know, and they said, shame looks like another man because it was men who were shaming them into being a certain way, into obeying the rules um, of manhood. So in the book, what I was just trying, really trying to do was to absolutely not shirk the issue of men's violence and not shirk the issue of men's entitlement, but also just show men like, it's not that you need to understand your power and your entitlement as a charity issue or as a gift to women. <laughs> Do it as a gift to yourself. You know, if we can only appeal to self-interest <laughs> in some of you, see how this actually affects you and affects the quality of life that you're going to have. And a big part of that was really realising that a lot of men who perpetrate violence against women um, they may fool themselves into thinking that they've got everything they want, especially the sort of high level narcissists um, who think that they're in power and that's exactly the position they want to be in. But a lot of these guys are miserable. You know, there's a reason why in New South Wales, when the homicide, when the death review team looked into suicide and the issue of suicide with um, people who had histories of domestic violence, to their surprise, they found more perpetrators had suicided than known victims. You know, so this is, a lot of these men are actually miserable people, you know, um, and unpacking why they need to take power and why they need to, you know, use that male entitlement to, to overpower, to shame, to degrade, um, to, um, to minimise their partners and to hold them in a space of control and domination is not working for them. Mm. Um, and there's other, there are alternatives. There are other ways to live, but it just takes work like all of us, anyone unpacking their own power and privilege, it takes work. Like Nidal said, you have to educate yourself. It's uncomfortable. You know, even my publisher, um, who's a lovely guy, said reading the patriarchy chapter was uncomfortable for him. Um, but ultimately he felt included. He didn't feel excluded by the way that, you know, that, that I was writing about it. And I really try to talk about it in that way too, so that men feel that this is something that they can be included on, that they need to listen to get educated on, but they can be included in this conversation. Thank you both. That was really helpful. Um, and as we've heard throughout, uh, listening and learning is a really big part of, um, of becoming an ally and of becoming aware of your own power and privilege. Um, and as part of uh, National Unity Week, there's something called National Mosque Open Day. Um, and I always encourage my kids to get along to that, take them along when I can, um, and my friends, because I think it's better to learn about people of another faith or culture or experience through, you know, relationships and conversations, as Nodal said earlier, rather than from your social media feed or from politicians using fear to divide us or from the media that has uh, another agenda. And if we're going to be able to work on these, these issues of, of gendered violence and of men's abuse um, together, understanding some of the unique issues facing refugee and migrant communities and refugee and migrant women is, is key. And so, Nardo, I'm wondering if you might share some of the broad issues that the Harmony Alliance uh, are working on. Um, recognising, as Jess said, that, um, that these communities aren't uniform, but do you share some common experiences as refugees and as migrants settling um, in this uh, very white Western colonial culture that we have here? Could you, could you just share some of those things that we can learn about, about those experiences with us? But like most, like most group of women, you know, migrant women come from very diverse background and uh, from many, many countries, different religions. So our, our issues, um, I suppose, present differently in public, even to ourselves. And there's a comment that uh, just made before, which I think it's really useful. And that's the comment of this expectation that somehow there has to be agreement within groups for us to move forward. And I've seen that used so much um, to sort of say, well, we can't work with them because they don't really agree on anything. I think, I think disagreement is it's invited in, in any platform. So, but I think the, the migration history and the history of being a minority present common themes about the experiences. And the, the most obvious is, and, and I think the, the space that um, Harmony Alliance try to occupy 
is the first thing of just getting our voices heard and getting our issues taken into account and those issues being taken seriously. And, and the additional issues that when, when um, public policy laws or you know, approaches are being considered by those in power, that they do think two things. First, that they, they, that they have a lens that looks at it from a much wider perspective than just the mainstream lens. Um, and that involved obviously thinking about whether in the first place is to cater for, 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 diverse, for a diverse group of people or in the second place where there are unintended consequences of certain, certain laws that seem neutral on the face. Um, but you know, in, in the area of domestic violence especially, the challenge that we face is how do we communicate the obvious patriarchal issues that we have that all the other community shares without them then being turned around and being made as a part of our identity as cultures or religions. So, um, you know, my experience is that most women do not want to want to report abusive um, husbands to the police, partly because there is the community stigma that exists within certain communities, my community, very conservative socially, but because they're afraid that if they do so, the narrative then become those migrant violent cultures that don't change. You know, it's, it was fascinating to me, um, fascinating as a thought, thought exercise, not in the real sense, but what, when the minister introduced the new sets of Australian values. And, and one, of, one of the you know, suggested questions is whether or not um, people who, who want to become Australian citizens should accept that men, men and women are, are equal or should, should, be, um, or should, be, uh, should have access to equal uh, opportunities, um, and in fact, whether they oppose violence. Now, in a country, in Australia, where we lose, is it a woman or two, you know, uh, a week or, or, or you know, a fortnight to domestic violence, where the representation of women is still a challenge in almost all our public spaces, where domestic violence occupy most of police time, you know, every day. The suggestion that this is a question that needs to be posed to a group of immigrants is misguided. <laughs> it's misguided because it seems to uh, it seems to suggest that this is not a some, something that exists within the wider community. When in fact, it's one of our biggest biggest problems. Um, and secondly, I think it creates the perception that somehow mainstream Australia is doing better in this area than migrant groups. And so our focus and our concern should be on those people with their cultures and their religion because they are the ones that are poisoning our society with this backwards treatment of women. Um, it's, it's a narrative that is really embedded in fear mongering to some degree. Um, and um, it's, it's, it's frustrating to see because I think it does far greater damage to, to migrant and refugee women um, and to advocates because we are tremendously careful of what to say in this space because we don't want to then have to fight two fronts you know, trying to fight for the voices of women to be heard within our community. And then all of a sudden finding yourself trying to fight for your entire community. We are not all violence and we do not all embrace this, uh, this idea. And it is not to suggest at all that there are not issues within migrant communities that need to be dealt with. And, um, but those issues are not necessarily obviously because of culture alone. Some of them are just intergenerational issues. You know, the perspective I have on gender, and how I raise my daughter are absolutely different from the way my mother was raised and what she thinks yeah. is. That's far more intergenerational than it is cultural. You know, it's, the, it's, it's also the fact that I've, I've had the chance to live a life that my mother could have only imagined. And so it, that exposes the, another issue that I think we face in this space, the, the falling back to old narratives that are not applicable to the difference in migrants, whether it's a different of race or culture, but also just a difference of the intergenerational difference. And I think part of the reason, um, and my closing remark, part of the reason is that a lot of what is pushed forward in these spaces, um, it's still stuck at seeing migrants a, as a monolithic group of people, 
Um, and two, as if somehow all of us are stuck at the point of entry in this country, so somehow mm -hmm. we are never transformed by the act of being in this country, we do not change, mm -hmm. just, you know, or, or that we would always be limited to the perimeters of identity and belonging and whatever that our culture has or our practice brought here. It fails to see us in the transitioning of living in a different country and the differences in it. You know, um, take a marriage equality. The people in migrant community that voted against it are much older, the younger ones, completely different. The narrative, migrant communities were predominantly you know, against yes. in-sex marriages. So mm -hmm. I think those are the kind of challenges we face in being able to tell our authentic stories because of the limitations that exist within this, this space. Mm. Yeah, like I was thinking, I was talking to um, Dr. Manjula O'Connor today, who is a psychiatrist in Melbourne who works predominantly with um, South Asian women um, and, and migrant South Asian women. And she's saying that so many of these women will say to her, they'll come to her, um, most of them who have experienced um, coercive control from their partners, and they come to Manjula and say, well, when we were in India, like we would expect that the system would not help us, but we come to Australia and we expect that, you know, here you have access to, to gender equality and you have access to people who will protect you, but here the systems abuse us. When we go to the police, we get misidentified as perpetrators. You know, when we go into the court system, they are, the abuse continues and the, you know, the authorities collude with our husbands. You know, so I think, you know, and I, I noticed this too, um, living in Lebanon and, and connecting with the Lebanese Australian community over there, you know, there's, there are different ways in which different countries um, perform patriarchal norms. In Australia, we like to believe that we are so much more advanced than, than other countries. Um, and so the way that we do it is much more diffuse and more insidious. Um, you know, I remember um, someone Lebanese saying to me like, you know, in, in Lebanon, we give bribes. Um, here, you have rates, you know. Um, <laughs> but it was just sort of like the way in which you know, people have to pay for certain things here is is different. It, it sort of, it, it has this whole thing of access, only the wealthy have access to certain things in Lebanon that would be much more informal. <laughs> um, here it's formalized. Um, and it just, it's, it's so interesting, the different, the structures that we have created in Australia to help us believe that we are so much more advanced on issues like gender equality. And like Nidal's saying, you know, like, you only need to look as far as the makeup of federal cabinet um, or the number of, you know, federal female um, parliamentarians to see that when we, when it comes to the higher echelons of power, we don't, we don't take a gender equal stance. You know, walk into a police station and look at the senior police there. They are almost exclusively men. Um, you know, it, across Australia, you've got 80 to 85% the police officers are men. Um, so, you know, all through Australia, the, the, the lie that we are, that we are so much more advanced um, is betrayed by our actual actions um, and the way in which systems of abuse get perpetuated um, through the systems that are supposed to protect vulnerable people or not even vulnerable people, just people who are having shit done to them, you know, like, but are supposed to stand between people who, you know, perpetrate or offend um, and those who are offended against. And too often um, there is a, a level of collusion in this country with perpetrators and offenders um, that just totally gives the lie to the idea that we are, uh, that we've made a lot of progress on that level. And, and sometimes it's just absolute institutional blindness that I've, that I've witnessed. Um, so, um, um, say a good example is there's a, there's a group uh, there say what, one, one thing that is becoming really common is a form of abuse is the exploitation of social media to either publish intimate photos of women and, and in certain communities, the cultural consequences for having your naked pictures 
put out there are tremendously damaging, just, just damaging, damaging to the point that some women have committed suicide. So that's, that's the cultural stigma that, that comes from being exposed in that way. And men in this country, you know, men from these communities know that. They know the cultural stigma on a woman's reputation. And so they know that they can go online. And you know, even if they don't expose pictures of her, they can just abuse her online, you know, use the language. And then you report that to Facebook. Facebook doesn't speak Dinka or nowhere. So it doesn't breach their standard because they don't understand it. And so some of this abuse have been going on for years and years. And cause such significant mental health damage to their victims and their children um, that it's just criminal. It's truly criminal. Like I can comfortably really say that. Like it's, it's, you know, some of it is blackmailing them so that they don't put their pictures there. And, and these women have gone to the police, they've reported it and the police just tell them, you just ignore it. You know, there's nothing that can be done about that. You just ignore it. The other thing is when most women come here from say, you know, a lot of the time the men have more opportunities to go to study because they're not at home with small kids. Culturally, they're not expected to raise small kids. So what they quickly get to understand how the system operates and they get to, to speak English and they run rings around these women in courts. And you, you begin to see how the court system, legitimate court processes or legitimate processes are used as tool of abuse. You know, so they refuse, for example, to sign the passports of their, of their children um, and that means that the woman, for example, cannot go and visit her dying mother in Africa. Um, they wait until a woman has left the country, you know, probably her English is not good, then they go and pick up the kids, start a case in court saying she's neglected those children, she's abused those children. All of a sudden, the woman has lost, you know, care of her children. It becomes a battle. Most of these women are single mothers relying on settling. They can't afford the court, uh, the, the, you know, the, the, the fees in the system. Um, they rely on interpret interpreters that will come and tell them exactly what, what has happened in, in, in the courts because I like most people who appreciate confidentiality and the responsibility of that. That's not a very culturally understood concept. And so there's all these layers of unseen abuse and unseen um, uh, kind of just this, this, this heel of abuse that I, you, I don't even know where you begin to get the institution to understand, to cast an eye, to knowing that some of the way they operate uh, don't work. And, and just cultural misunderstanding too, a woman turning up in court and not looking directly at the judge's eye, you know, a sign of respect, all of a sudden you look fishy and untrustworthy. Mm. And there's a mark on your character. So there's a lot of other issues happening as well um, in this society, in addition to the active, I think the active exploitation of fears in certain spaces um, to other these women. And, and what about the ways that the, the kind of law itself in regards to, to migrant women in, in particular um, are used to make life harder and to make um, violence worse and responding to violence even harder? I know, I know the Harmony Alliance is doing a lot of work in this area and changing some of those problematic laws. Can you speak to that? at all, not all, and Jess as well. Uh, one of the biggest areas, I'll do this quickly so Jess can have a word, I realize. That's that. all right. No, I please. Go. Uh, go. One, one of the biggest areas where we've seen this abuse occur is the use of visas, um, the visa process mm -hmm. to, to abuse women. So the men bring the women here, um, and then because these women are on their visas and they don't have their citizenship and maybe sometimes employment right, they use this as a tool of abuse to take away, you know, their, the citizenship, I mean, they'll take away, they'll, they'll get their video to books and return. They don't have a lot of rights. So we're, the, how many alliances trying to work in this space to, to get governments to think of ways where that, the, 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 the visa system doesn't become a tool of abusing, abusing women. Um, another one that how many alliances is not working on, but that I've, that I've um, seen in, in my experience is, um, is, is men going back home and marrying underage girls. And, and then bring them to this country where they've either changed their names, they've changed their age or, or, or things like that. And, and, the, and the government, it's very hard to pick up because there is no really communications between the governments to understand what is going on. So that's another area of, explo of exploitation and that, it, that, that is occurring. And, and it doesn't have to be official as a, citizen, as, uh, as, um, as a visa itself. It's, it's, the, it's the opportunity to come to a country like Australia. That in itself, can become a tool of 
oppressing somebody because you are telling them that I'll offer you this. And as a result, if they should take abuse or they should take mistreatment because you're offering them this opportunity. Mm. And in certain communities, the value of coming to a country like Australia mm. is enough to in itself be seen as a payment of a dowry of some form. Just mm. that. And it, is it also the case that um, women on temporary visas in particular can't access a bunch of services that um, like financial support and, and others that um, that citizens experiencing violence could could access? You get that all. That's that's correct. Yeah. Yeah. So we have a situation where if uh, if people on temporary visas are experiencing violence, basically they're stuck because they can't access um, medical support, financial support, um, some of the automatic kind of financial things that happen that are triggered in Centrelink that have ac no access to all of all of those supports. And um, and like you said, they rely on um, the men in their lives for, for their for their visa status as well. So we have yeah, a situation where people really are trapped. Um, Jess, do you want to touch on that at all? Yeah, I mean, um, I know that there's been a lot of work in New South Wales, particularly um, with women's safety and the other peak bodies, really trying to lobby government to to change that situation. I mean, even to the point where, you know, um, women and children's refuges, uh, they, their beds are subsidised, but they they can only accommodate a certain number of women on temporary visas because those they don't get a subsidy for those women. Like that's that's the level at which mm. those women are, are restricted from just accessing what is like an emergency service. Um, and I certainly know from talking to Yasmin Khan, who heads up Eadfest Community Services in Brisbane, um, she's constantly sort of um, representing women who are here on temporary or spousal visas at tribunals where there has been family violence and where their spouse has you know, threatened to withdraw the visa. And the sorts of racism that she just encounters from tribunal members mm. like on a regular basis is just horrifying and, and one of the um one of the instances i talked about in the book was you know this old guy in his 60s who had brought over a woman from fiji in her 40s this guy had been on workers comp hadn't worked for ages was incredibly abusive towards her um and a member of the tribunal was clearly colluding with him in her statements to this woman, you know, saying, well, you know, what were you thinking basically? Or what did you think was going to happen? Like you come here from a very different culture. How did you think this was going to work? I mean, just the most shocking sort of callous thing to say, to, especially to a woman who had at the time um, a child who'd just been diagnosed with a very serious disorder um, that if she was sent back to Fiji, wouldn't have been able to get medical treatment for. The, the, the child was, a, you know, a product of this guy um, who had brought her over. And yet just the the lack of empathy um, and just like street level human empathy, nothing specialised, mm -hmm. um, you know, shown towards that woman was just shocking. But that's what... Um, Yasmin would encounter every other day, you know, in, in representing these women at these tribunals. Um, so, yeah, I just think that the, the gap between how we see ourselves and our values um, too often is just a gaping chasm between our actual behaviours. Um, I think a lot, of, a lot of countries where they've actually been able to be up front about the fact that they have strong, um, strong threads of misogyny or strong, you know, strong um, histories of racism, all the things that, that advocates have been trying to get Australians to realise here. Um, they've actually been able to take quantum leaps um, out of the systems that, that harm people towards systems that help people. And mm. one of those, you know, I talk about quite a lot is, um, is in Latin America, where the police stations for women have, have worked for the last, you know, well, since the 80s, so almost 40 years. And that was born out of, you know, a period of right-wing totalitarianism in which police and, um, and the judiciary were actually involved in kidnapping women, having them impregnated, kidnapping their children. You know, I mean, like, it was so overt 
that there was absolutely no way once those countries democratized that that the police could respond to gendered violence so they had to come up with an entirely new way of doing it you know and so they started these police stations for women um, which was staffed primarily by women um, whose mandate was really to 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 pursue a feminist agenda um, to uh, work on behalf of the victim work with the victim and what they wanted to do um, and and to do so in a way that was trauma informed and those women's police stations um, have an incredible record of um, where they operate having reduced domestic homicide rates but they also you know it's instead of just waiting for this incremental change where you know, a culture that was infused with machismo was maybe going to get incrementally better and that police responses would get in incrementally better. Um, they went, you know what, we're just going to like turn the whole system upside down and do what needs to be done. Now, in Australia, trying to have that conversation with police here, you know, they'll say, but we've done so many good things and we've got this gender equality program here and we've, we've, we're going for 30%, you know, female officers and we're all that. It's, but the progress, even with the most dedicated and devoted um, work, is so slow. And in the meantime, the harm is enormous. And if we were able to just go, you know what? Yep, our systems are pretty misogynistic. Um, our systems are pretty racist. Let's like completely rethink how we do this. Instead of just going, well, just trust us, we will improve, we will improve. It's like, well, how long are we going to wait for the incremental improvements? And why don't we just admit to ourselves <laughs> that this is the sort of work that will, that will take a century to, to have the kind of, you know, um, advances that we're looking for, if, if that even happens, and just try something different. But until we admit that to ourselves, no one will, will go to the effort because they'll just think, well, there's no point, we should just keep on incrementally improving um yeah so yeah and i think about the at that kind of meta level of the culture in which our attempts to prevent violence and respond to men's violence um occur uh, i always also find it kind of interesting that like australia basically has a policy of violence towards vulnerable groups like we have a the powerful have a policy of violence against people seeking asylum we mm. see our political leaders dehumanising and stereotyping and intentionally harming people in detention centres, including as a deterrent. And children <laughs> as a deterrent and, and you know, it, intentionally using violence to achieve state outcomes um, and kind of in a, in a culture, I guess, that, that uh, validates and legitimises violence. Um, how does that interact with the idea of ending men's violence against women when, when violence is basically endorsed? extremely poorly. Um, <laughs> you know, I think Evan Stark, who wrote the book Coercive Control, um, a few, you know, about 15 years ago, said it really well. And he said, you know, just getting people to um, talk about stopping men's violence is pretty easy. You know, people can say, yeah, I don't believe in men's violence towards women. That's a horrible thing. Who would do that? But getting them to confront men's control over women or men's control full stop is a lot harder. Because how do you get, you know, how, how do you get politicians, for example, to say that they oppose the, the notion of men being entitled to being in control when they actually represent that ethos every day um, in their actions um, and, yeah. Um, so, so but, but I think that that absolute cognitive dissonance and almost schizophrenia that we have as a nation, as you say, in our approach to asylum seekers and what we've had in place for, you know, going on 20 plus years now, um, as you say, where, where, where violence is being used as a, a state mechanism um, to apparently deter asylum seekers from coming to Australia. Um, that is the kind of cognitive dissonance in which, and, and the gaps in which people who use violence, people who um, use entitlement in their relationships, that's where they sit. You know, that's where we all sit. Until you have the, this reckoning um, with, with who we are, and that's why, you know, what's in the, um, the Uluru Statement 
things like truth and reconciliation councils, you know, the sorts of things that we saw in South Africa, where you, where you actually recognise the gigantic harms that you cannot move forward unless you can sit with that harm, hear the people who are harmed and try to get advanced towards reconciliation. You know, um, it's often, it's occurred to me when I've been studying coercive control that it seems very much like what the asylum seekers and refugees on Manus and Nauru have gone through um, would fit that pattern of coercive control, um, of being isolated, of being degraded, of being threatened, of being promised and then denied things, you know, um, of being trained into compliance, of being induced into debility and exhaustion. It ticks all the boxes and that is a government system, you know, that has been, and that, and coercive control is a form of torture, internationally recognised as a form of torture. You know, um, for a while, interrogators were using it at Guantanamo Bay. And even there, once it was recognised what was happening, that was um, banned. So, I mean, that's what we're looking at. It's something so serious that in somewhere like Guantanamo Bay, where torture um, was experimented on, um, or to different torturous methods were experimented with, coercive control was seen as something so beyond the pale that it was banned. And yet I would suggest that we're probably, we are using it in our Manus and Nauru. I mean, what does that say? How do we say as a nation um, that coercive control should be illegal? How can we say as a nation that coercive control um, is unacceptable in our households? Nairo, do you have any thoughts on that um, topic? Yeah. Um, in some ways, um, I think what 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 the difference in how we treat people that we are classed as a, the less human in some ways, by the way we treat them, um, is it's so entrenched in uh, wanting to be controlled. Western society. I mean, that's, you know, you look at the founding document of the United States, all men are born equal, except the blacks, you know, so this, it, it's part of, you know, or, or, or the notion of terrenalis, the, the very notion, legal notion that was established this country. Well, indigenous people existed in this country. You're claiming that these are land without people and occupants, when they are people and occupants. So I think the narrative of always dividing people and subjecting certain groups to abuse and discrimination and 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 suffering is lives comfortably within a lot of western systems that consider themselves democratic egalitarian and humanitarian whether you see the united states or australia here um, and I think that's why the periphery sort of revolutions, or if, if you can call them, that are happening around Black Lives Matters and Indigenous recognitions are trying to puncture that narrative and say, there are two stories here. You're not what you tell yourself. You are what happens to other people, you know, as well, whether it's the imposition of Indigenous people and, 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 and what is currently occurring in Manus Island. Um, so I think that's going to be a really tough battle going up, that, that, that core issues of how do we see women as fully human, how do we see migrants as fully human, or at the very least as fully human as we see a white man, you know, and that hasn't really shifted. I don't think that's shifted uh, uh, so much. Um, so my, my comment to add to what Jess is saying is that this is, this is the reality that, that existing in societies where what is being said and what is happening to you are completely different. That's sort of the reality that most, uh, most migrants and, and, and people of color lives in when they find themselves in the context of countries like Australia. I have find it slightly fascinating to see COVID, the, the reaction that people have had to COVID-19 and the way that parallels with some of the conversations that people experience racism or gender related issues um, talk about them, this kind of relentless cloud that never goes away. It is always there that has the potential to harm you, but you don't know when it's going to do so, that you really can't control. Um, and the exhausting nature of, of living such an existence as a person of color or as a woman 
um, perhaps maybe with what is happening across the world that we will begin to sort of punch the single narrative, which has been the Western narrative of how we see people and how we protect people. Um, Part of, part of the issue with the patriarchy is also imperialism. It's really, it's that, it's one power feeding off another, feeding off another, and creating a hierarchy of people, um, and, and, and therefore a hierarchy of who's protected and who's not. Mm. Yeah, I've always found it very interesting, I guess, when the, the, the state um, or the, the powerful say, you know, you people can't be harmful to those people and so we're going to, to eliminate men's violence against women but we can be we can be harmful to this group of people and you know you, you shouldn't have uh, inequality and humiliate that group of people men um and, you know is the focus at the moment men not humiliating and harming women we're going to put a lot of money and effort into that but at the same time we're going to harm and humiliate people of color or, or migrants or or etc. And, and I think you're right that that um, overall cultural picture of the powerful um, feeling like they have um, the the right um, or the entitlement to um, to treat the vulnerable in that way creates a, a hard environment for us to address men's violence against women. Um, and so yeah, it is a, it is a big cultural questions for us to answer as well. Um, I know that we, we've been speaking now for 70 minutes. Um, I wanted to ask you both a couple of questions um, for us to listen and learn um, from you about what we're doing at, at White Ribbon Australia a little bit. And one of the things we've been talking about is community-led solutions to, to men's violence against women. So, um, you know, we're using the phrase community by community, workplace by workplace. Um, but the idea of it is that I, you know, I don't have the solutions to gendered violence in a culture that is not mine or, or a faith group that's not mine or, or even, you know, simpler than that, a geographic area that's not mine. The, the um, problems and the solutions that face communities are, are unique. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're encouraging people to start community action groups in, in faith groups, in multicultural communities, in geographic areas, in workplaces that kind of address the unique um, circumstances that those um, groups face. And I guess I, I'm just wanting some advice. Do you think that's a good idea? How should it work? Um, is, that a, is that a good way forward? The, the general concept is I don't think this is one size fits all um, and that we need um, yeah, young men, young uh, men to hear a message in a way that resonates with them and with you know, role models and spokespeople that they understand and, and et cetera. So I wonder if uh, each of you could just speak to that um, concept for a moment and, and how you feel about it. Nidal, do you want to start? Okay. <laughs> so um, I think it's excellent. And I know having spoken to many, many um, different um, communities, um, city councils uh, over the last year, there are people who are just absolutely hankering for a way to make a difference to this issue in their communities. I also know that, you know, when I was looking around the world for the things that works, like what actually works to reduce domestic homicide, what works to reduce rates of child removal, you know, um, because of domestic violence, um, you know, the things that worked were the community led strategies. It doesn't work to have just one section doing all the work, like having, you know, you could make police perfect, but then when they refer cases to the courts, if the courts aren't included, well, those cases will fall over. You could have the, a, a perfect domestic violence sector, the fully funded, but then if police aren't on board, you know, so you get my point. Basically, even if you have, you know, individual sectors doing things perfectly, if they're not working together, if they continue to work in silos, um, then it, we don't see the change that we need. So the two strategies that I looked at in the book were um, focused deterrence and justice reinvestment. Um, the, what they had in common was the community getting together and saying, no more, we're not going to accept this. Um, we are absolutely declaring this as our number one issue 
and we are going to do everything in our power to interrupt and stop it. Um, the other thing that they both did was start a process of um, communication between various groups. So in, um, in focus deterrence, for example, it was, um, this is in High Point, North Carolina. Um, it was police, um, the judiciary, the um, community sector groups, domestic violence groups, drug and alcohol, um, you know, all, all of the different um, parts of the community that were responding to this issue, mostly in silos, they started to get together and for two years, they worked to get to know each other, they worked to get to know what the problems were and how they could best solve that. Um, and what they had was this sort of carrot and stick approach. And this is a bit the same with justice reinvestment, although not quite, which was to perpetrators, we love and um, respect you as, as members of this community. We want you to be fully fledged members of this community and we want you to be able to do the work to change your behavior and we will help you. If you accept our help, we will help you. But if you do not accept our help or if you do not help yourself, and if you do not change and if you continue to offend, then the law is going to come down on you like a ton of bricks, basically. Um, there will be no loopholes. Every loophole that existed before will be closed. The loopholes in the police and the way they charge, the loopholes in the judiciary and the way that they prosecute, the loopholes in the federal marshals and the way they pursue you if you cross straight state borders, all of those loopholes would close. And the way that they closed those loopholes was to meet every morning, um, for four days a week, and they would um, discuss between the police, the judiciary, domestic violence sector, etc., what had happened in the past 24 hours and casework all together as to how they were going to do this. Um, I mean, the same sort of thing happened with um, justice reinvestment in Burke. Um, over, you know, over 20 different language groups, um, a history of division after the missions closed nearby and language groups sort of dispersed into, into Burke. There was a lot of work that had to be done before any sort of action could take place to get all of those language groups in a type of a grants where it's like, this is what we want to pursue, you know, um, and, and to have everyone feel like they were represented, even down to the kids in town, you know, the, the young teenagers to feel like they had a voice on a council where their needs and wants um, would be represented. And after those two years, they start, they looked at, okay, we need data. Where are people being criminalized? Where is domestic violence starting? How can we interrupt this? And once they had the data, they started looking at what are just practical things we can do to change this. If we have some of the highest driving license offenses in the state, and that's how a lot of our young people are being funneled into jail, well, let's teach our young people how to drive for free. Let's get volunteers from the community. Let's buy a car to teach them in. Let's get them driver's licenses. You know, like really simple things that would just stop that pathway through jail, through criminalization, through the hardening and all the things that could lead as they became adults and went into intimate relationships into, you know, into domestic abuse. And bringing police on board with that was absolutely fundamental. But bringing police on board in a way that when they would get a call, it was an opportunity to intervene, not to just incarcerate, but to take, you know, a community leader out with them, take someone out who could help this perpetrator with whatever issues they had, be it substance abuse, maybe it's grief, maybe it's trauma, and to address that. And so really taking this approach from every angle, from the justice system through the community, that we want to help heal people. That's our objective. But the the all of community response was absolutely fundamental to that. And in both of those areas, High Point, North Carolina and Burke in Outback, New South Wales, um, the results have been stunning. You know, in Burke, almost 40% reduction in um, repeat victimisation rates, um, but also things like historically low rates of child removal, um, historically low rates of people accessing um, crisis payments from Centrelink. All of these data points that show you because police data doesn't show you much, given the low reporting rates, all of these different data points that show you that community is getting better. You know, they are becoming more harmonious. There is nothing else that works aside from community action. No. 
this has kind of answered that comprehensively. Mine is more almost a question and reflection. Um, because when you're dealing with certain communities, you're dealing with communities within communities. So you're dealing with a migrant community within, say, a mainstream community. And when there are conversations happening, there are parallel conversations happening. So say, for example, national conversations that are about um, attitudes towards women, uh, changing those attitudes, government investing in you know, advertising or royal commissions or whatever. So you've got that conversation happening at that level, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's the same kind of conversations that are happening within say, the other migrants community themselves. And so when it comes to the issue of taking their voice in, it presents its own challenges because um, it's important that we do have migrant voices um, in conversations, but at the same time, there is a question of whether or not those, there are certain voices that are problematic. So <laughs> I'm trying to find the right words. So, you know, in communities where men are predominantly the leaders of those communities, men are predominantly those with powers. When we talk about hearing people's voices, those are the voices that then get fed into the mainstream mm -hmm. conversation. But if, if these communities were, say, back in their own countries of, 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 of origin or country of birth or country of connection or ethnicity, um, the second problem that I'm going to discuss probably won't come up. So sometimes what I find in this space is that people would say that the very nature of conversation happening in the mainstream are inherently racist or assume them to be racist. People in the mainstream then become really careful about challenging patriarchal practices in those communities because they are afraid of being um, told that they are that they are um, that they are racist. And so what then happens is that sometimes the mainstream conversations happen where progress is happening, while the conversation within this community remains stagnant because nobody wants to be told that they are racist. I'm hoping it makes sense. And so what is happening is I think when we talk about implementing migrant voices, there has to be some very serious and comfortable conversations that have to happen within those migrant communities and, 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 and then between the two communities. And as a feminist, I think I have sat in rooms where the conversations in taking in the voices of migrants sounds like just a patriarchal conversation happening about how power is transferred from one group to the other. And where the men in those spaces talk in very problematic ways that are assumed to be cultural and therefore cannot be challenged. Mm. And that raises some really complicated things for, say, women um, and, and, and question of integration and, and settlement. So my solutions to them, and this, is, this is just what I've arrived at thinking. If we're going to have conversations nationally, or issues nationally, whether it's about recognizing same-sex marriage and stuff, uh, whether it's um, you know, changing attitudes and investing in schools and, and government institutions. And we've done that through, say, you know, all this that is happening about sexual harassments in workplaces and all that and trying to change that. When we're having those conversations, then, then the automatic position, in my view as a feminist, is that that's the expectation we're setting for the whole community. There is no set of expectation that takes in the cultural, the religious, or the other. I'm not now, I'm speaking as a feminist, not as a list here of, of Harmony Alliance, because I think that this is where we face a lot of problems as migrant women. We get shut down twice. If you, if you could we get shut down within our own communities because we are being told that we are attempting to be white or so, being racist, and then we're being shut up, shut out at the top because the people in power are afraid to say anything to offend these groups of people. Um, so I suppose that's just more reflection about the existing challenges within these communities. And, and so when, you know, White Ribbons, for example, is trying to be a big national body, and uh, want to take in account of what these opinions are. I think, I think this is a life issue that doesn't, doesn't necessarily get seen and addressed. Mm, I think um, just on what Nadal was saying and, and also taking in one of the comments here, um, Julie Piddle has, has, has um, pointed out the No More campaign, which is um, an initiative of Indigenous man Charlie King, and it's rolled out through sporting clubs in the top end and is getting great results. Thank you for that comment, Julie. Um, and the reason why I bring that up in response to what Nadal was saying is that um, when Charlie would go into those um, sporting clubs, and, and he told me about 
one initiative he did in Ramanginning, for example, where they had to actually cancel the local football because it would create so much tension and violence um, after the football games that they could no longer run those football games for years. Um, and Charlie was brought in to sort of restart football in that community in a safe way. And the first thing he did was to make sure there was equal representation of men and women on that on the board of the football club. Um, and instead of just having men play football, he'd have there'd be men's football and women's football. And you know, before the men's football match, the women would dance and there'd be a cultural presentation before the men's football, the women's football, the men would dance, you know, and it was it was absolutely integral that there be gender equality in those, in, in changing that, you know. So I think in terms of, I understand that this doesn't necessarily fix what Nidal's saying about there being, you know, fear to call out certain practices. Just having equal amounts of women and men from a certain community is not gonna drown out those very powerful voices. But I think that if you, if you only go to existing leaders in certain communities, then you run the risk of replaying the same dy power dynamics instead of actually creating something new that will represent the whole community. And part of finding out about that is, as Nadal said earlier, spending time and talking to people, you know, like actually having those face-to-face -face connections and talking to people who aren't in that sort of like alpha echelon <laughs> about how does this work for you? Having confidential conversations that, that you know must be confidential where people hopefully will feel like they can open up about how these sorts of power dynamics work or don't work and maybe how they can be subverted in some ways that does not absolutely upset the the balance in that community and cause problems but at least has different inputs from people who maybe don't get represented mm. And so it kind of comes back to where we started that if uh, people are not aware of their own power and the way that they're using it in a problematic way, then the solutions can't, can't flow from, from those positions of power. So yeah, that's really, really important feedback. And, um, you know, and a lot of what we're thinking about, I guess, is, is seeing the way that colonial and, and paternalistic approaches to trying to solve um, challenges of First Nations communities, uh, you know, have been such a, a failure because um, we know that the communities have within them the solutions um, to the challenges that they face and can't be imposed from the outside. So it's important, um, I guess, what, what we're hearing you say is it's important to uh, make sure we're developing those or working with those who are aware of their own power and willing to relinquish it where it's problematic. Um, I know it's not as simple as that, but that's kind of putting together some of the, the feedback um, that you've said so far. So yeah, as, we, as we wind up, what I'd love to hear from both of you is just a bit of advice for all the men sitting here on the, on the chat tonight. What advice would you give to men from, from different communities and different locations um, as we uh, try to be a part of ending men's violence against women? I know it's a very big question, but if you if you had a man who was willing to be teachable for a moment, what would you say to them? You know, the easiest and um and and fastest route to understanding that I would I would recommend to all men is um is read um, bell hooks. <laughs> um, she the way that she balances um, accountability with love and compassion and the belief in in men's capacity to to change is extremely rare and um, masterful. And her book, particularly the Will to Change, is I think it should be a textbook for men on on how to enter greater understanding about their behavior, but, but also about what's open to them if they open up to understanding how, how patriarchy has affected them, has, um, has cauterized some of their emotional connections and, and what, what an alternative life can look like if you can sort of challenge some of those habituated um, um, ways of living. So yeah, I always say like read bell hooks, um, read, um, but also just, uh, study the work of First Nations um, women writers. Uh, Judy Atkinson's Trauma Trails was an absolute revelation for me. Um, and, and understanding that our way of life is not 
the way that we live now and the and our colonial history and where it's brought us to now is not inevitable um that this is not the only way um and that there are so many other cultural ways of coming at things so many different ways to to live that if we just open our eyes to it and open our open our eyes to the world's oldest continuous living culture um and and the traditions and wisdom in that culture um bring us so many different approaches to problems that I think we're stalling on um, and behaviours we're stalling on because we keep on taking a white approach. Um, and as Julie says in the in the comments, talking up to the white woman, white woman, um, Eileen Morton Robinson, essential not just for men, um, but but also for women. Um, it's a bit of an academic text. It certainly was written that way, um, but it does cut through and and holds women to account for their own their own role that they play in in continuing an oppressive patriarchal culture even unconsciously um so i i always think too that as much as men have got a role to play in in, in facing up to these things and certainly the harms are very strong from men that women equally need to unlearn their patriarchal habituation as well mm. not because they're responsible for an equal level of harms but because we are all living in a system that is like a feedback loop and um and we've all got to unlearn it thanks jess Nairo, advice for men i will also start by suggesting a reading um chimamanda adichie's um book uh article or it's a, i think it's also a ted talk why we should always be feminist mm. We, we should all be feminist. It's really good. It's very simple read. Um, and you can decide whether it's persuasive or not. That's a good place to start. But uh, this conversation is somehow a swung between the personal and, and the social. And when we talk about what when I think I, I, we say about allyship being a personal journey, it's because even if in this journey of self discovery of learning and unlearning, um, even if you don't get to change the world, you get to change your immediate environment, the women in your life, how you treat them, the women outside your life, how you treat them, the women in your workforce, how you treat them. There would be a point of contact for those women in their daily experiences, and you be the point in which they don't experience an indignity that day. But I think that's still important, where you carry yourself as an individual. It doesn't matter what they eventually we are able to change the world. The third thing is to move away from that, you know, if to, is to be able to get yourself to a point where you doing that is not a charitable act, you know, that it is something that you truly believe is important, not for your country or for your family, um, for this world. My uh, feminist hero, um, happens to be a man, you know, uh, Thoman Sakara, who, who was a revolutionary fighter in Burkina Faso. And he says the conditions of women is therefore at the heart of the question of humanity, here, there, and everywhere. This was a man for the image of African men, of these things being bullies and powerful and dictators. This, is, this, this was a very enlightened man that framed his idea about being an ally of women as a necessity to the progress of the country, as a necessity to humanity itself. And if we convince people, enough people, about the core humanity of women or other races, I think that a lot of this work gets to do itself because we don't tend to abuse or undermine that which we think is human as us, is, is dignified as we are. Thank you so much. That was really awesome. I love that um, reminder of you might not change the whole world, but you will change the experience of the, the people around you and the women uh, in your life. Um, by reflecting on those aspects of yourself, that, that's really powerful. And, I would really love all of us to do a, a silent clap for Jess and for Nido being with us tonight. It's um, some pretty incredible, eloquent answers that you gave this evening. Um, and uh, yeah, really, really powerful um, learning for all of us, I think. Um, and I think it showed in the chat and 
Um, almost everyone stuck around for the whole uh, 90 minutes too. So uh, thank you so much for your contribution, both of you, and for what you contribute um, to the broader um, goal and of changing the narrative and the culture um, here in Australia on so many fronts. Um, and in eliminating men's violence against women, but also in making us a more welcoming, inclusive, equal society in general. Thank you so much. Um, also wanted to thank Harmony Alliance for partnering with us on this um, event tonight and um, for all you do to represent, uh, walk with and advocate for refugee and migrant women in Australia. Um, and uh, our custodians, Communicare, who um, many of the staff have been gathered in Perth watching this evening. And also to AFSA, Sasha, Trent, Scott, who Patrick as well, who have been helping out in the back end, um, holding this webinar together. Thank you so much. And thank you everyone for joining us. Um, if you're interested in learning a bit more about community action groups, check out our website. It's also a bit of our focus for White Ribbon Day this year, not an event that is a purpose in itself, but pointing towards um, ongoing sustained community led action. So love to have you involved. Thank you, everyone. Oh, I would like to just finally give a shout out to my sister, Vicky Wellgraven, who is a fantastic um, First Nations leader from South Australia, who was on our first webinar with us and is here tonight. So uh, great to see you, Deadly Sister. Um, farewell, everyone. Thank you for being with us. See you soon.